Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Meta Series 6. This is our second virtual event. Before we get into the day's session, I'd like to thank a few people for supporting this event. Okay. I'd like to begin by thanking the Dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Rodney Lynn. I'd also like to thank Drs. Um, Shannon Salt Brown and Kim Ramsey White, as well as all listed on the screen. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for your support. I'd also want to thank our guest speakers for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Leandris Libert and Dr. Ramoladis Azwini for taking time off their busy schedules to be with us. Really, these are really, really busy people. And so we are really thankful and appreciative that um, you are here with us today. And I cannot rest my case without thanking my awesome, very, very awesome Meta Series Committee members. Now, when I say this event wouldn't have come up without them, I really mean it. I mean, these are people who've dedicated their time, you know, their support. They've, they've met with me, you know, endlessly. We've had lots of meetings. And I just want to say thank you all. And if you if you guys don't mind, just join me in giving them a big round of applause, you know, for your help, for your support. I really, really appreciate everything that you've done. Without you, today wouldn't be possible. Now I know we have a, um, a short announcement. Amber, you ready to give us the announcement? Yes, hey y'all. So my announcement is just for you all to stay until the very end of the event, because if you want any chance of winning a prize from our virtual raffle draw, you must stay until the very end. Because if your name is called and you're not there, you can't win a prize. So just stay until the very end and I promise you won't regret it. Okay, so you had the woman. She said, stay till the end. I mean, I'm just the messenger. She said, stay till the end so that you can win the wonderful, wonderful prize that's in store for you. All righty, so um, Jake, Cold Iron and Atoteta, what do you guys have planned for us today? Jake, take it away. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Mensa. So first, we're going to hear some brief remarks from some very important people. Then we will have a super fun virtual icebreaker, after which we'll have a quick plenary to hear from our wonderful guest speakers. After this, we have the Dean's remarks, the virtual raffle draw, and the event evaluation. All right, thank you for the info, Otto. Now let's actually hear from the undergraduate program director, Dr. Kim Ramsey-White and department chair, Dr. Shannon Self-Brown. I think Shannon was first, right? Sure, I'll take it, I'll take it first. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Meta Series 6 on this beautiful, beautiful, um, is it Thursday? Thursday afternoon. Um, we, I wish we could all be gathered together, but of course, this is the safest way for us to do a group event right now, but it's fantastic to see so many faces. I feel hopeful and excited that perhaps this fall at the next Meta Series, we, we can be in a room, but we will just see what the guidelines say at that time. Um, I want to thank everyone who has put effort into planning this event, and I'm so excited to see what's in store today. And I hope everyone is feeling uh, just more value than ever in your choice to um, pursue an education in public health, because there is no more important time in the world for people to be focusing in classes and learning and development on these uh, important public health issues. And so thank you for choosing public health and being here today and look forward to the events ahead. Thank you so much, Shannon. Hi, everybody. It's really great to see everybody. It's really great to continue to see our Meta Series program continue to just grow and for people to still find such interest in it. Um, Dr. Armstrong Mensa did a lot of thinking of other people, but I think we got to give Dr. Armstrong Mensa a huge round of applause. <laughs> because this was, uh, many of you have heard me say before, this was birthed out of her vision and she has held on to it and continued to just build it and make it worth people's time and effort. Um, I feel very fortunate to have her and the rest of our colleagues um, on our team and helping us to continue to just speak into our students, continue to build our students up, help them to be as prepared as they can possibly be to go out and face the next pandemic or the next public health uh, issue that we have to deal with. So thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight. Looking forward to, to hearing from our speakers. Uh, we're in for a treat, trust me. All right. 
So uh, we're going to go ahead and start with our icebreaker. Uh, you're going to need to have either split screen your computer or use your phone and you look at the chat, you'll see that you go to the website kahoot.it and they'll ask you for a game pin and you'll put that pin code in. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about the game to them? Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Niha Mita and now we will be playing a fun game of Kahoot. For anyone who does not know how to play Kahoot, it is an interactive trivia game. You will have to go to kahoot.it and we will put the code in the chat box and you will be able to see it on the Zoom call as well. You will have to use your web browser and put the link followed by the code. When playing this game, have both your Zoom and whatever device you are playing Kahoot on at the same time. The question and answer will appear on the Zoom call, but you will be answering on your phones or laptops with the appropriate color choice. Make sure to answer the correct choice as fast as you can to have a higher chance of winning. There will be 12 winners at the end who will get a prize. Does anyone have any questions before we begin? And how you'll get your prize is that you'll get an email from Dr. Armstrong Mensa. Again, on your phone or on your device, it'll be color coded so you don't have to look down at your phone every question. Now, let's get it started. Oh, wait, well, actually, let's wait, let's wait. We got about 30 something. We had 80 people in the room. Should see that pin. That's all right. If you win, y'all let us know who you are. about 80 people out, 44. Uh, you can join when the game starts as well. It'll be on the bottom right corner. So we'll wait till we get uh, about three, three fourths. And again, the website is kahoot.it. And you type in the game pin. about 30 seconds and we'll get started. All right, again, you can still join in the bottom right of the corner, you'll see Kobe. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. It's all trivia. What is always coming but never arrives? See how it's color coded? It can help you with answering the question. In seconds. Five seconds. Oh yes, tomorrow. The other answer. The other answer is Martha. Oh, Jamila, Fr, my. I see y'all in in first, second, third. What South American country is that one? Oh, my quick fingers. You see how it's color coded and you help you out. Don't, don't be Googling nothing now. Yes, Argentina. Whoa, look how the tides turn. 
All right, come on, future Georgia State alum. Five seconds. The 1913 Society. Whoa. Whoa, okay. Oh, wow. Look at this change. All right. Angelica in the lead. What country's flag is this? Oh, Ivory Coast. I know Ireland is flipped. The colors are flipped in Ireland. Google it. Judy coming up. I see you. FR holding it down. Eleven, the alphabet. Yeah, it's a little one of those trick questions now. Oluwadara, you can you can come back. I see Harry on your tail though. Which is not a COVID nineteen symptom. Memory loss, that's a symptom of lockdown, not COVID-19. Oh, Judy's still holding it down, I see you. Rachel coming up in the world, here we go. About halfway, halfway there. Went to space and served in Pete's court. My, well, not not Harriet Tubman. Come on, three people. It's cool. It's all right. No judgment. Oh, okay. All right, Judy, you're getting some competition now. Public Health 101. Five seconds. Come on, don't be flipping through your books now. Yes, yes, NCDs. Oh, Angela's on fire now. All right. Four more questions. seconds. Oh, Lewis, not uh, Hamilton. Okay, Harry and David, I see y'all. Three more. Public Health 101. Chapter 13 or, or 12. Yes, Medicare. It's easy to get those mixed up. Oh, oh, okay. Hola, Wadara. I see you. And Angela. Yes, Pluto is a planet. Don't question us. Uranus, Uranus. Whoa, 
Oh, the tides. Okay, Angela. Come on now. Come on. Some of y'all gonna say your hand slipped. It's not Dean Lynn, but we will hear from him later. Okay, on the on comeback. Okay. Last question. Last question. And remember, the, the top 12 get the prize. In 55 regional uh, cultural icon. Waffle House, Waffle House. Here goes the podium. Coming in third, David. Judy. And in first, we have Angela. Jamila and Zuri in fourth and fifth. And the other nine uh, are eight players. We will also be uh, messaging you directly. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Kramie and Niha. Now let's move forward and hear from our wonderful guest speakers. We have two guest speakers for today's session. And after the presentations, we will have a Q&A. The Dean invited guests, faculty, students, and all attendees. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker. Dr. Leandus Libert is the Associate Director for Minority Health and Health Equity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Libert has played a critical leadership role in ensuring a rigorous and evidence-based approach to health equity and ethical practice of public health in vulnerable communities. Dr. Libet has received several honors and distinguished awards for her leadership and management accomplishments. For her seminal role in developing local, national, and international partnerships, Dr. Libet was honored with the Excellence in Collaboration Award by the CDC's Division of Diabetes Translation. Dr. Libet is also exclusively noted for her excellent role in the administration of the CDC Undergraduate Public Health Scholars Program and the James A. Ferguson Graduate Fellowship. Let's welcome Dr. Leandris Libet with a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, first of all, I just um, want to thank um, Dr. Mensa and Dr. Ramsey White and the, the Meta Series Committee for the invitation to be here this evening. I like you so wish we could um, be together and hopefully I'll get another invitation and be and we'll be able to do that and be in the same room. Um, I also want to thank my colleague um, Jessica Franks, who is a doctoral student, a DRPH student at Georgia State. Um, she is working with me this evening and I'm not sure when Jessica came into our lives. I know it was sometime last year, but we can't imagine her not being around. So if these are the public health professionals that, that you all are producing, then we have a great need for their expertise. And so I wanna thank Jessica for just being present tonight. And I um, mean, I also wanted to add a comment um, just about being in public health. Um, two things, well, I've now been in public health for more than three decades. And um, unlike a lot of people, like they get to a certain point in their career and they wanna do something else, that's never been my case. I have loved this work um, from the beginning and have been able to thrive and hope if I've given a fraction back to the nation, to communities that this work has given to me, then I will 
walk away very, very pleased um, with the legacy of my career. And so um, I really am excited for all of you who are also pursuing this track. Um, it is a work that um, is demanding, but it's always, it's always needed. It never gets old, especially not if you're at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And um, it's just a very uh, powerful journey. So I welcome you and thank you for being in that journey. And I also want to um, let you all know that today is my birthday. But because Dr. White asked me to come and she had asked me before, I would not have missed it. So when I signed, when I logged on and I heard the music and there's been so much energy, I just love it all. It's like, this is my party. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing that. So I'm gonna ask Jessica to go to the next slide. She's gonna advance the slides for me. And um, I get the, the honor of being the uh, Chief Health Equity Officer for CDC's COVID-19 response. And I wanna talk a little bit about that role. Um, it means that I am not in my uh, full-time role as the um, Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, but we are so closely linked. I feel like I have one foot in the office and then the other foot, maybe two feet in the Chief Health e Equity Officer um, unit. So we could go to the next slide. Um, last year, uh, actually in May, um, the Chief Health Equity Officer role and function was established for what we call our incident command um, structure at CDC. I guess early in the year, um, maybe around March, April for sure, we were starting to see the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in communities of color and other communities that we have identified as being at the disproportionate risk for not only infection, but also for severe illness and even death. And so in May, um, I was called into this role and we stood up what we now refer to as the Chief Health Equity Officer Unit. And our first um, charge was to create a health equity strategy that would address the increasing health disparities and inequities that the pandemic was actually exacerbating. And also we were called to, um, to create what we called um, an all of response approach so that we, we didn't want it to be perceived that all of the work related to addressing health disparities would fall on this unit, but that the entire incident management structure, which is comprised of I don't know, 10 or 12 different task forces is a fairly complicated structure with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, over 2000 people engaged. We wanted to make sure that this perspective of health equity was being infused um, across the entire response. And so if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to start out, and, and I think that this certainly is, um, well, maybe not as important for you all as students in public health. But as we are increasingly giving more and more presentations uh, to public audiences and kind of non-health, uh, non-public health audiences, we're he we hear a lot of language in the, in the news. And so I wanted to, I always like us to start with just some grounding um, definitions. And so for us, and I know that you all understand this already as well, health disparities, particularly when we, when we think about racial and ethnic uh, populations and other groups um, that, that tend to experience a higher burden of injury, disease, and pre premature mortality, it's not just a difference in health status between population groups. But it is what we describe as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. And that's very important to, to consider because there will be people who will tell you about other population groups that may be 
experiencing a higher burden of a particular condition, but that is not a health disparity as we tend to think about it. And then our other expression that we're hearing a lot these days, and I'm really excited about that, but people also have different perspectives around what health equity means. But our definition is it's the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. And all is really kind of the operative word here. And there's a subtext that goes with this that says, in order for us to achieve health equity, we have to first of all value everyone equally. And sometimes I say, if we just stopped right there, if we were as a nation to value everyone equally, we would be halfway down the road to achieving um, health equity. And so what are we needing to, to um, value everyone equally to do? Well, we have to do it with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities. Avoidable is a very important word. Historical and contemporary injustices and the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. And so what I hear a lot is I am now in many, I mean like my whole reason for getting up in the morning is to be part of these conversations. And I think a lot of people think about health equity really as the elimination of health care disparities. And that is true, but it's also a much broader concept than that. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we want to just look at this um, graphic. I'm sure you all have seen this many, many times. And it really then looks at what's the difference between equality and equity. And, and we can see you know, what that means, right? That when everything's equal, everybody has the same thing. But in order to be equitable, some population groups will need more in order to achieve um, the same outcome. And so then an equitable approach focuses on more equal outcomes and recognizes that more disadvantaged groups may need more support or resources to achieve the same health outcomes as groups that are not as um, disadvantaged. So if we could go to the next slide, please. I want to jump into what we have identified through COVID-19 is what we call health equity considerations. Next slide, please. So when we consider um, racial and ethnic minority populations and what are those factors that contribute to increased risk, we understand coming out of the gate that issues of discrimination, including racism, are contributors, that healthcare access and utilization that one's occupation, uh, one of the things as we, we have been doing this work over the last I don't know, eight months, um, we have been able to really call out the fact that almost 80% of black and brown workers are in occupations where they cannot do their work from home or what we have now come to call essential workers. We also know that educational income and wealth gaps are contributing to the disproportionate risk and also housing, housing in terms of space. Um, you all know early on when we were talking about people quarantining when they were infected and being able to quarantine at home wasn't always possible um, for all households. Um, we also are seeing now um, housing instability and a lot of other um, factors associated with housing. So let's go to the next slide, please. So when we think about um, inequities, and um, a lot of times when, you know, again, this is language that we use, or, or people will hear us talk about health equity, health disparities, health inequities, and social determinants of health. And so, a health inequity, kind of by, de by definition, is defined as a health difference that is systematic, that is 
avoidable and that is unfair. And we could sit for a very long time really trying to unpack that and then figure out what does that look like in terms of, let's say, public health policies and practices. But when we think about social determinants of health, I mean, similarly, um, they are conditions in the environment in which people, where they live, where they are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect their health and their ability to function and succeed and their quality of life. Um, I, was on a, 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 I was on a radio show not long ago and just calling out some of these, what we call social determinants. It was interesting to me that it was it was enlightening to people because even groups that are disproportionately impacted in, at some level have internalized sort of the personal responsibility perspective. And I always wanna be clear that we never wanna absolve people of what they can do, but there's so many things that are a function of the social environment, the context in which they live, that is actually helping to shape their behavior, and that's not always in the direction that we would want as a public health professional. And so if you ever go to the Healthy People um, website, you will see um, this graphic or similar graphics. But I want to call out from Healthy People 2030 um, that there are five what we call domains for this, for social determinants you know, and trying to capture a very broad arena. And they are economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, the neighborhood and built environment, and the social and community context. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so then we, we also have to consider in terms of what is driving disproportionate risk, barriers to healthcare. Things like, and again, not unfamiliar, health insurance coverage. Um, I would also add, you know, not having paid sick leave. We've seen again that um, many essential workers are in occupations that don't provide paid sick leave. Um, unreliable transportation um, is also a barrier uh, to medical care. Um, stigmatizing language in medical practices and materials, um, kind of what people encounter, how they experience the medical encounter, how they are spoken to, um, can ultimately become a disincentive for wanting to seek medical care. And then also access to medical resources. Next slide, please. So in light of, you know, what we were understanding, if you could go to the next slide, um, Jessica, about, um, you know, health disparities, health inequities um, in the face of COVID. This is what um, the reason why we needed to develop this strategy. Um, what we were seeing is that and we understood this. Someone asked me recently, were you surprised by essentially like what had happened? Well, I can't really honestly say I was surprised, even though COVID was new, it was a new virus, and no one really knew the full weight of the devastation that we've seen with this. If you work in this area long enough, you could anticipate that there was going, there would be a, a disparity. And so we knew, for example, that COVID might worsen already existing health and social inequities. And that data highlights groups at increased risk of COVID-19. For months now, there's been like a full court press around increasing particularly racial and ethnic data um, completeness. And we also knew that we had to have effective public health intervention uh, planning in order to address the unique circumstances of um, population groups that would be at increased risk um, in order to um, increase the opportunity for us to be effective. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
So the um, health equity strategy was written at a pretty high level. We consider it an organizing framework. Um, it was not intended to be directive um, because again, as I said before, when we think about different population groups, we think about people who live in rural areas, when we think about people who are justice involved, uh, people who have disabilities, those people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, it's, I don't think it's possible to have like a single um, very directive plan, but, but these four strategies um, we stand behind as really being um, an important way to come into um, our, our goal to achieve health equity um, during this pandemic. So the first one was to expand the evidence base with data to inform the impact and factors that influence the burden of COVID-19 on populations that are disproportionately impacted. And I spent a lot of time talking about what we knew going into the pandemic but over time, we've been able to expand the evidence base through special studies, um, and that's helping to um, increase our understanding and then further direct our efforts. The second strategy was to expand programs um, and practices to reach populations that have been put at an increased risk. And these programs and practices were to um, um, increase access to testing, um, to contact tracing, really to help people understand why contact tracing and why you're being asked so many very personal questions. Um, to increase um, access to isolation options for people who couldn't quarantine at home, to increase access to medical care. And also at the time when we stood this strategy up, we wanted to do more education about vaccine trials and the impending vaccine, not really knowing we would have one. Um, so quickly. And so then our third priority strategy was around expanding program and practice activities to support essential and frontline workers to prevent transmission of COVID-19. So in addition to healthcare workers, the other essential and frontline workers that we were focused on were, you know, restaurant workers, grocery store cashiers, people who drive public transportation, um, people work in construction, those kinds of occupations that are essential and that they have allowed our society to continue um, in, as well as it has. Um, and then our fourth strategy was one that was initially very, was turned more inwardly to CDC, which was we wanted to expand an inclusive workforce equipped to assess and address the needs of an increasingly diverse US population. So we understood that we needed to bring into the response as we call it, people who have not only different um, disciplinary backgrounds, but also different life experiences because, and also people who are multilingual, bilingual and bicultural. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So what are we doing in the face of all of that? And again, we don't have time to really go into um, a lot of details, but I will say, you know, at a very high level that we are providing assistance uh, to public health agencies and others to expand testing, contact tracing, isolation options and medical care. Uh, we're facilitating partnerships between public health agencies, tribes, scientific researchers, professional organizations, community organizations. I mean, we're, we're really reaching across um, our society in a broad way. We, we're offering technical assistance to local communities with COVID-19 outbreaks. And we're also supporting um, essential and frontline workers, as I mentioned um, earlier. And we're developing guidance to implement programs and practices that are in different languages and that are culturally tailored for different um, populations. Um, I think the, you know, the last time I asked about language translation, I think our prevention messages have been translated into over 55 uh, languages. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to, instead of taking up time today, just direct you to our, re, um, our website 
which has um, a lot of information about um, the resources that are available through CDC uh, related to addressing COVID disparities. And then the next slide, um, more, more resources. This is again our web page, and so please take time to visit. And to go to the next slide. So I was asked to talk about like what are some internships and other programs that CDC has um, that students you know can participate in. And again, you know, I can direct you to our to our website, but I did want to say that. Um, there are at least two um, programs that you might be interested in right now. One is what we call the CDC Undergraduate Public Health Scholars Program, or we refer to it as CUPS. It is an undergraduate program. It's for uh, rising juniors. Um, and then you can, it's a summer program. So any, any point from your rising junior to recent graduate. You can participate in the program, I think, up to a year after you've graduated with a bachelor's degree. Um, this program has become quite uh, competitive um, and selective. Um, we get, so there are five academic institutions that administer the program, but it is a national program, which means that everybody around the country can apply. But the five academic institutions are Columbia University in New York, the University of Michigan, Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is in Baltimore, um, UCLA, and Morehouse College. And um, each of the universities is funded to um, be able to host up to 50 students. So we have 250 slots, and we get somewhere between four and 5,000 applications uh, every summer. And so the acceptance rate is somewhere around like 4%. So it's, it's pretty competitive, um, but we're, we just completed uh, the first evaluation of the program. This is the 10th year anniversary of CUPS. And you know what we wanted to do was to introduce students to public health. We wanted to introduce, we wanted to interest them in our public health career. And they spend 10 weeks in doing a, a project. Um, the Morehouse College students tend to come to CDC, either in Atlanta or one of the other sites. Like we have, we have a, um, a site in Colorado and in West Virginia, some other places. Um, but anyway, because I know my time is, is running out, the, they get a stipend for the summer. Um, you know, the housing and things like that is provided by the university. And, you know, each of the universities does it differently. But what we're finding is that the program has been, has been successful in doing exactly what we wanted it to do. And we will be publishing the findings from the, um, the evaluation along with the a special supplement of the Journal of Health Promotion and Pedagogy this year, and it'll capture a lot of experiences from Cups. So we're very proud of the program. Um, we're very proud of the alums and the work that they're doing. So that's one. The other program is the James A. Ferguson um, Emerging Infectious Diseases graduate fellowship. So this is for graduate students. So if you are interested in emerging infectious disease, COVID-19 is absolutely one of those. Um, that is a program that we also support. And it's also competitive um, in that there are uh, not as many slots. But what we're going to do this year is we're going to add additional money to Ferguson. Um, and we really encourage you to apply. The last program, the Millennial Health Leaders Summit, we haven't done that in, in a few years. And so I won't talk about it, but um, one of my colleagues recently did a search on um, some of the students who came through Millennial Health Leaders and she shared it with us, kind of the work that they're doing right now. And again, very successful. Um, next slide, please. 
So in the midst of all of what we're doing, we want you to know that, you know, everybody has a role to play in addressing um, COVID-19. And, you know, these are just some of the groups that we are partnering with and working closely with. So if you want to go to the next slide. And again, in terms of even as you are a student, what are things that you all are doing or can do? Um, you know, reaching out to populations, experiencing barriers, accessing vaccines, volunteering, um, you know, through your university. I know that the Fulton County Health Department has a big call out for volunteers right now as they're going to open up the um, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and start to vaccinate thousands of people. Um, and also, I think this one about promoting truth to your networks is particularly important as we are constantly trying to, you know, overcome misinformation and disinformation about the vaccine, about the virus. And also in terms of modeling prevention of COVID-19, I am confident that you all are wearing a mask whenever you're in public, that you are washing your hands, that you are staying six feet apart from the next person and that you are avoiding crowds. Right, okay, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> so that's all. I hope I didn't take up too much time, but I look forward to hearing from you all and having a conversation about this. Thank you so much. Thank you so and much. Thank you for the birthday greeting. That was sweet. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for the insightful and informative talk. We really appreciate it. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Rumi Ashwini. He holds a doctorate of public health from Morgan State University, a master's in public health from Howard University College of Medicine, a diploma in registered nursing licensure from Kennington University and St. George's Hospital Medical School in London. He is an alumnus of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Executive Leadership Education course. Dr. Swinney is a health scientist administrator and a program officer for the All of Us Research Programs Data and Research Center at the National Institutes of Health. He is the editor in chief of the International Journal of Maternal and Child Health and AIDS. His research spans from health disparities to various areas in global health with publications in leading journals. And now I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Ashwini. Thank you, Adrian, uh, for a wonderful introduction. I think uh, following, um, following Dr. LeBird is actually a big act and I will try. But I think one of the important things uh, about my presentation today is that I'm taking a community-based complementary approach to all that you have heard from Dr. Liberard. She has set all the background for you. So, but what I'm trying to do today is to walk you through what I have seen as a very small strategy for public health students to get their feet into the door of public health workforce. And I'm very glad that Dr. Lorraine uh, was able to talk about diversifying the workforce, the public health workforce. We have studies that demonstrate that the more diverse we can get the public health workforce, the better we are able to address health disparities. So first, let me try to thank uh, Dr. Menser for inviting me. Um, we have been working together on a number of publications and I always love being among students because as somebody who has done this a while, when we see students, we try everything we can to encourage them to come into public health. So I thank her for the opportunity. I thank the organizers. And I thank all the students, you know, I can see teamwork here, going on here, trying to replicate what is actually true life of public health. And I call that 
public health in action. Next slide, please. So in my brief talk this evening, what I'm hoping is to give you a refresher or a reminder on public health and health. And I think Dr. Lloyd had done that very well. And then uh, begin this argument on the use of a publication as a viable tool in your toolbox for employment in public health. I will try to do this by sharing what I understand over the years, uh, being an employer of public health um, you know, personnel, trying to get you get into the mindset of a typical public health employer, and then give you some thoughts on how I think you can start. Next slide, please. So Adrian has shared about my background, so I'm not going to um, you know, belabor again. Um, my research focuses on health disparities, social determinants of health. I do MCH and health services. But I think it's important for me to also emphasize that I think what brings me here this evening is my passion for community-based participatory research. I know some of you may have heard about researchers who come to the community. They do this helicopter research. They just come to the community, do research on the community, and they do not engage the community. So one of the things I did um, in, at Morgan State University, being a historically black college and university, is for us to be embedded in the city of Baltimore putting into practice community-based participatory research, being there for the community, remembering that in, especially in our communities, in our immigrant communities, in African-American communities, in low SES communities, if you are not at the table, you will be on the table. So CBPR is an opportunity to bring a level playing ground between researchers and members of the community, ensuring that you are addressing the needs that are driven by the community rather than your own hypothesis or your own research. And I just need, I just want to point it out that here that mentoring is my passion. I have a cadre of public health professionals from undergrad to master's to doctorate to postdocs that um, you know, I have been fortunate to come across, co-learning, co-creating, and mentoring them into what I think are very thriving public health responsibilities. Next slide, please. Um, I think today you already heard this, but I always try to begin uh, all my talks in the community by just giving a quick overview of what is public health? And I like these two definitions. One is from last, the dictionary of epidemiology, you know, and it tells you how old I am. I still read books. I don't read everything online. I still buy books and read them. And my kids laugh at me. So last actually defined public health as one of the efforts organized by the society to do what? Protect, promote, and restore the people's health. And then the Eccleston report in England actually even put that more simply when they said that public health is the arts and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting health through organized efforts of society. And I just wanna point out here how the World Health Organization defines health. It is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It doesn't mean the absence of disease or infirmity. Next slide. So I just want to put in here that an employer always thinks that you will do well in the new position because you did well in your prior position. And so they are always looking for you to show some evidence or indications of what you did in prior positions, and they will be willing to give you a chance if you can show them something. And I think that is important for, uh, for you when you are thinking of entering the workforce in public health for the first time, 
trying to understand that they believe if you have done well in a prior position, you will be a good match in that present position. Next slide, please. And so how does having a small thing as a publication address employer's mindset? Remembering what the employer thinks. So I believe doing a very small piece of work, getting it published, walking through the rigor, demonstrates to potential employers that you are a critical thinker, that you have writing skills, that you can work in a team, that you can pay attention to details, and that you can persevere. I can tell you, anybody who has published a paper, even if it's one page in a journal, will tell you, if you are not resilient, you're going to give up. The rounds, sometimes the rounds of reviews can be very, very traumatic. Next slide. And so one of the things I've always mentored students uh, recently is actually to begin small, you know, trying to write even something as simple as a letter to the editor, you know, where you can use it to react to prior published paper, explore a new topic, or share your passion and add some data on it. And I think this is using authorship, you know, to get your feet in the door. Next slide. So, the point I'm making today is that as you are always dreaming, you know, desire, and we welcome you in public health, there are very simple low hanging fruits you can do. And I believe that doing something as simple as a letter to the editor, working with your mentors, you know, working with your colleagues, working with your professors to get that letter to the editor is something that will come out in your resume for an employer. And that player, knowing that he or she, the hiring manager is always thinking, show me the evidence of what you have done successfully, and I will give you the opportunity. So I am so excited and I'm looking forward to that you asked, but I just want to tell you that if there had been any day that people asked you why public health, COVID has made that response so easy. You can see communities coming together. You can see the value of your work. You can see the essence of bringing the community to address um, health disparities. So I'm looking forward to opportunities uh, to begin the discussion and also to interact with you and to share my thoughts uh, working for, uh, for several years in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Remember the questions that we asked you to fill out when you were registering? Well, we will now be asking those questions. Dami? Hi, okay. So our first question is for Dr. LeBerg. In your opinion, what are the positive and negative effects from COVID-19? Wow. Um, I don't know if I really need to reiterate the negative effects. Um, I mean, it's really affected every aspect of our lives um, in not necessarily a good way. But I think that if I had to say that there is a positive impact, I hope that we have a whole new consciousness about our physical health as well as our mental health. Um, I hope we have a new consciousness about social cohesion and the need to be connected to neighbors and family, because there have been so many, I mean, there, there are big instances and small instances. For example, I, I hear about, um, you know, siblings who all are taking turns trying to get an appointment for elderly parents because they don't know how to navigate, you know, the, that whole online system, things like that. I mean, so, so for me, it's having a new consciousness about our health, what we need to do to take care of ourselves. Um, and also, I mean, if I could take a broader approach in terms of there's this uh, intense interest around health equity that we see all the way at the federal levels. So we have an opportunity now that I've not seen in my career um, to really set some things in place systemically that would tend toward achieving health equity. 
So that that is a positive. Thank you so much. Yes. The second question goes to Dr. Sweeney. What type of careers are available for those who have equal interest in research and field work in public health? Angelic, I think that's a very good question. Um, it depends on the setting, right? Um, like, I, like I pointed out in my presentation, if you are passionate about working in the community so I think one thing to think about are what careers are there in the community. And, and I do really encourage all of you, regardless of the setting where you work, to be entrenched in your community because sometimes it is always very easy to find what is not working rather than being the person who critiques, who finds what is not working. I encourage all of you to be part of the solution. So um, number of the positions in the community, you can be a public health analyst, uh, public health uh, program coordinator, um, community organizer. Uh, there are several federally funded programs like Healthy Start, uh, like the Home Visiting Program that you can actually work on in the community. But remember, the job of public health does not lie in the title. It lies in the action. What are you doing to change one life? What are you doing to change a family's life? What are you doing to bring all that you have learned in theory into practice? And what do you bring to the table? What is your passion? So I always encourage people, don't be you know, misled by the title be guided by what you are bringing to the table. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Dr. LeBert. What can we do to promote health equity and COVID-19 vaccine allocation and distribution? So the first thing, um, you know, I would say is that you can you know, help to promote what we call vaccine confidence. Um, that as a trusted messenger, that when you talk about um, the vaccine, that it's safe, um, that it's effective, that you really help to debunk a lot of the hesitancy that we see in, in a lot of communities. Um, I, I think the other thing you can be you know, is what we call um, a vaccine champion. And I know that you all are in an age group where are not yet sort of in line to receive the vaccine. But, you know, I think at that time, um, have, I think it's important to be able to share your experience with, um, you know, with people who are still kind of on the fence and not sure that they want to do it. You have incredible power. And your voice is, is very, very powerful. And your credibility is very, very powerful. Um, I would also, as I said in the presentation, encourage you to volunteer to um, help people who may need to get a ride, for example, to get the vaccine, or even to get an appointment for one, because that's particularly challenging. Um, you know, make yourself available to people who, who aren't as savvy with the computer and help them do that, help them get to the appointment. So, I mean, those are some things that I would encourage you to do. Talk to your family members about it. Do your own research so that you can answer questions that they may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the last question is for Dr. Sweeney. Dr. Sweeney, how can we operationalize equity in research? I think that's a good question. Um, a few things. I, I think mentorship is very, very important in your research. Tell me a good public health researcher and I will tell you that there is a group of wonderful mentors. So a few things that you can do, this could be from the topic that you want to investigate. This can be generated by past research this can also be part of your lived experience. 
And then I think once you figure out, you know, with uh, trusted members of your mentoring group or your class, your professor, the other thing is to get into the research proper, you know, where you try to pose the question, right? What is my research question? And then you try to straight that onto the hypothesis. You know, what are you expecting to happen? If A were this, what would you expect to happen in B? And I think it is important for us to bring our core values to research. That's what I do, because if you do not, you know what happens? You do that work one year, two years, you get exhausted. But if you are actually doing your research in an area that you are very passionate about, you never run out of interest. You wake up every day, you want to pose the next question. The other paper is published, you are thinking of new other papers. And I can't tell you enough about researching about issues that impact your community. The research questions are unbelievable. They keep coming. And I can tell you um, the immigrant community, the immigrant experience, the immigrant health paradox, right? There are issues every day, issues around access, issues around who even gets pain medicine in hospitals. You know, there are the unbelievable opportunities which sadly exist in health equity, I think gives you an opportunity to pose new questions, not only addressing your own passion, but have the potential to transform your community. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all so very much. Very informative, very interesting presentations. I surely have learned a few things and I hope you've also learned a few things. Thank you so, so, so very much for coming. Now at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our Dean, the Dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Rodney Lynn, and he will share a brief, uh, well, his brief remarks. And then I have a few questions that were posted as people were registering to ask of him. So uh, Dr. Lynn, I'm sorry to put you on the, on the spot every meta series, but um, <laughs> I know you understand. Thank yes. you very much for joining us. Yes, Dr. Armstrong Mensa, thanks for uh, your, your welcome and introduction. And it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be with uh, all of you. Um, uh, thank our, our speakers for, for spending time uh, with us. Um, you know, it, today it's, um, as I remember it, um, been a year uh, since this uh, pandemic really, um, it began earlier, but it really began uh, right around the time that the shutdown, that's when it really, I think occurred to, to, to many of us, this is a, a different uh, experience that we're about to have. And the, impact has been really significant, uh, especially for uh, vulnerable uh, and, and minority communities. Um, we've all made innumerable uh, modifications and adjustments to the way that we, we typically operate. Uh, and, you know, uh, some of us have been ill, others have seen family members ill, uh, lost uh, loved ones. Uh, and so, you know, it's been a very difficult and trying time, and we certainly recognize and, and grieve uh, the loss of uh, many lives, both family and friends. Um, I think one of the ways that we can best honor those that have really been lost in this pandemic is to really live our lives to the fullest and to really dedicate ourselves to being the best version of ourselves and really looking at what's the impact that we can make to better uh, our, our nation and, and even the world more broadly. So um, I think that the work that you all are doing uh, through education uh, and through public health uh, are central in that task. And so, you know, I'm really happy that in the School of Public Health, we're a part of your journey. Uh, we're happy to, um, you know, really support you uh, in your growth and development uh, and are excited about what lies ahead uh, for you. Um, this event, which normally happens in person, is critical and important because it, it, it allows us to really connect uh, with one another. And, you know, we're doing it through a different uh, mode uh, this time, but it's still a, 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 a nice opportunity to uh, build and grow relationships uh, that will serve us today, tomorrow, and in the many years ahead. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here to spend some time with you. In terms of uh, the School of Public Health, I mean, we're, we're uh, really in, a, I think, a great place uh, coming out of this pandemic in these next uh, months. 
uh, to really have a, a, another three, five, 10 years of incredible growth and success. We are fortunate to have record enrollment. Uh, people are choosing the School of Public Health in record numbers. Uh, and more important than record enrollment is record numbers of graduates that people are finishing and moving on uh, into their careers and, and really making an impact in the field. We're having, we've had a record year in research funding, which uh, bodes well for our students because it creates uh, additional and new opportunities for students uh, to, you know, be immersed in opportunities to do research and to, um, you know, really be prepared for uh, what lies ahead in their careers. Uh, we're uh, searching for new faculty, again, to, to serve the academic programs that we have, the students that we have. We have um, five different searches going at the moment uh, with focus areas in epidemiology, uh, our largest uh, area uh, in the graduate space and also central to our undergraduate program. Uh, and then our DRPH program, we're also looking for a, a faculty member there uh, as well. So we're really excited about that and are hoping for uh, success in those uh, searches as we seek new individuals to strengthen and diversify our uh, faculty. Um, we, we've added some staff and are in the process of adding additional staff to support faculty and students uh, in you know, area of career services, as an example. Um, and then, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll announce it here, though a more formal announcement will come later, but, you know, we've also secured through fundraising our first uh, undergraduate uh, scholarship. So we're really excited about that and some, you know, really generous uh, donors that have come forward to help us prioritize our undergraduate program, which is among our newest programs, but our, our largest program. And so we wanted to be sure that we're doing what we can to support students in that program. Uh, and then finally, many of you know that there's a search ongoing for a permanent dean for the school. And I'm really um, you know, looking forward to uh, the school having a permanent dean because that, that's a really important uh, uh, position. Uh, and I think it will really help to set the direction for the school uh, in the, the months and years ahead. So uh, thank you again for, for inviting me uh, to be here with you uh, to make some, some opening remarks. I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, that people may have about uh, the school, where we're going and what we're doing. Okay, sorry about that. So um, the, the first question is, how will COVID-19 impact the spring 2022 semester for students? Say that again, I'm sorry. How will COVID-19 impact the spring 2022 semester for students? Spring 2022. Um, yep. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're, we're a year away from, from that. Um, I uh, expect uh, that by the fall, we will be having in person, uh, in, you know, uh, for the most part that we will be in person. We have, um, you know, one of the things that this pandemic, uh, you know, has done is really shown us that um, we can be more flexible in the modes of uh, instruction that we use. Uh, and so while we will be in person, I expect there to be um, increased use of hybrid and online learning going forward. Uh, but I think our ability to get together in person uh, will return, and I think that will be welcomed by, by all. Um, and uh, I think that uh, beyond that, um, connecting to opportunities in the community and to do research and do things on the ground with other people is, is really going to make a difference for enriching the educational experience. So uh, I think, um, you know, the next uh, year, which is what you're really asking me about, uh, we, we will you know, transition this, from this spring into summer and fall to a situation where most people that want to be vaccinated are vaccinated. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of uh, what we uh, hope for will return in terms of person-to-person -person, uh, interaction. So I think that's a positive for our program, for the school, university, and the nation at large. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I know you talked, you mentioned something about um, vaccines, but this question is saying, are there any arrangements to get COVID-19 vaccines to campus for SPH students? Wow, um, that's, a, that's a good question. And I'm, I'm sorry that uh, communication has not uh, uh, been better. I think if you go to the GSU website and the GSU AHEAD page, 
Um, there, um, you know, we, we currently have vaccine coming to campus. Campus, uh, the health clinic is an authorized site for vaccination. Um, and students are eligible to receive vaccine through the clinic uh, and through the, the vaccination site we have on campus if they meet the eligibility criteria outlined by the Department of Public Health. So presently, as an example, if you are a first responder, uh, if you are a healthcare worker, uh, you're eligible regardless of your age to, to be vaccinated. Uh, and so uh, that there, if you're a caregiver for you know, uh, someone over 65, you're, you're, you're eligible. And I'll also tell you that the governor as, you know, has said that as of the 15th of March, uh, th there's gonna be a massive expansion. And you know, I don't think people realize how large the expansion is going to be, uh, but uh, anyone over the age of 55 will be eligible. But additionally, anyone over the age of 16 that has any one of a long list of uh, underlying health conditions will be eligible. Among them, diabetes, uh, hypertension, um, uh, and um, obesity. So, you know, I'm a person that do obesity research. I can tell you that, uh, uh, you know, that means some 75% of our population uh, in Georgia will be eligible. Uh, so there's going to be a, 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 a big expansion coming and, and uh, that will mean a lot of people will be getting vaccinated. But as students more broadly are eligible, uh, we will be getting vaccine to campus and we'll be distributing that. Okay. So this is the last but one question it says, can we walk on graduation with our masks on? Um, there, so there's what's going on with graduation this, uh, this past December, the way graduation worked was university had a commencement at the stadium uh, and individuals were able to attend and sit with their family. The idea of congregating uh, students together in the middle of the field is, is not um, uh, something we can do in, in, in the midst of COVID. Uh, and even spreading people out six feet apart on the field is not something that is uh, feasible. So there is not any marching that's going to happen as a part of the graduation ceremony uh, this spring. Uh, and, you know, that's unfortunate. Uh, but it's, a, I think, a reflection of the realities that we're, we're faced with uh, as it relates to COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question is, what measures are in place to ensure that students obtain jobs after completing the BSBH program? Yeah, that's a, a, a wonderful question. Um, you know, one of the things that I have, um, you know, just uh, invested in is really to uh, do what we can to add another position. And that person has been hired uh, to focus on career outreach and partnerships. Um, this position doesn't serve necessarily the undergraduate program, but it is about building uh, relationships between the School of Public Health and employers, uh, and really to understand uh, what's happening in the career uh, space, where there's opportunities, and making sure that we can communicate those uh, to our students. Uh, ultimately, the, the, the competencies that we uh, are focused on through the, the curriculum are the things that really we believe prepare students uh, for the opportunities they will have in the field. Uh, and so it's why when we went through accreditation just uh, two weeks ago, we had our site visit, uh, accreditors ask us, how do you know that students actually are obtaining these competencies? And we have to show uh, evidence that that is happening. So we're really proud of our academic programs. Uh, we made it through the reaccreditation uh, site visit uh, with flying colors. Uh, I think we had uh, the highest uh, rating on 45 out of 47 areas. Uh, and in two areas, uh, we, we, we had the second highest, but we were, we're still in compliance. And that's not to say where our school is perfect or that we don't have work to do in some areas. Uh, we certainly do, and we're looking at those. Uh, we engage uh, students, faculty, and staff in, thinking, in, in, in understanding what the concerns are. And the, if I look at my agenda in terms of the things that I'm focused on, in most cases, there are things that are, have been driven by feedback from students, uh, feedback from staff or feedback from faculty uh, uh, about their experience and the things that they need and, and want uh, to, to have a better experience coming through our program. I mentioned a faculty position in the DRPH program. That's a direct result of feedback from students. Career position, that's direct because of student feedback. Uh, so all the things that we're doing where we're using the limited resources we have 
are driven in large part by the feedback that is that comes to me, emails, uh, letters, all the things, the focus groups that we've done, things that we do to hear from, from you. So, so please keep sending us that information and, and letting your voice be heard. I think you're muted, uh, Dr. Mensa. <laughs> yeah, I was so enthusiastic about all of this, <laughs> and I didn't know I was on mute. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Lin, for answering our questions. You always come and and um, you know listen to us and, and answer our questions. So thank you so so very much. It's a pleasure At this point, to be I'm going to turn it. Oh, go, sorry. Go, no, it's go. a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Atu and tell us the last two things that we're left with in this program. All right, so we come to the most exciting moment we've all been waiting for, the virtual raffle draw. Now, I would like to invite Amber Bowers and Nivia Madina to take us through this session. Hey, y'all. So, yes, it's that time of the night for our virtual raffle draw. <laughs> all right, so before y'all get a little too wild over here, let me tell y'all it's about to go down. So when you guys all registered for this here event, we put all of your names into this here virtual raffle prize. Hold on just a second. And there we go. We had the technical difficulties there. But um, as you see, your names are all onto this virtual prize wheel. Now, as public health managers, we all know the science behind keeping things fair. So there's a 95% confidence interval that you will not get cheated out of a prize. There wasn't an actual study done though, so don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you should win a prize, you will be reached out by via email by Dr. Armstrong Mensa on how to redeem your prize. So have fun, everyone. Good luck. Nivia, take us away. All right, Amber, if you want to spin the wheel for our first winner of the night, let's get it started. Uh, let's see one second. And guys, when you win, just make sure. All right, so we have our first winner of the night. Congrats. Yeah. All right, so you'll get an email. Thank you. All right, second winner. Ashaya, congrats, you're our second winner. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Woo! Woo! All right, second email. Third winner. Yes, I'm here. Expect an email. Thank you. So we have another opportunity for a fourth winner, guys. Who will it be? <laughs> Lizbeth, are you with us for a fourth win? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Woo! All right, guys, we still have four more chances in our grand prize, so don't worry yet. So, oh no! All right, let's spin again for our fifth winner. <laughs> we 
Bianca, are you with us? Are you here? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to spin again until we get that fifth winner. See, this is why y'all got to stay to the very oh, end. She's here. she's here. I saw her staying. Oh, Bianca is here. Okay, okay, okay. Woo, okay. So, <laughs> let's go. We got our seventh and our eighth and then our grand prize. We got some really good prizes. So hopefully you're here. All right, seventh winner, are you with us? I, I, here. I don't see anything. Oh no. Here, right, let's spin again. Here. Oh, I didn't... knew that was here a few minutes ago. Yeah, she's here. I see her. She's on mute, though. Yeah, okay. I do know here. Congratulations. Can you see me? Oh, oh now no, yeah, she's on mute. <laughs> this is our last one before the grand prize, guys. <laughs> hear anything i don't see anything all right we're gonna spin again for our eighth winner eighth winner are you there it's chitty here Okay, maybe left already. All right, we're gonna keep going, guys. <laughs> oh, someone said they're here, but we haven't. Called. Okay. So I'm not sure whether um, Kiara Maddox is associated with hopeful, cha uh, hopeful change. I think so. No, no, sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> That's a joke. Oh, come on now. <laughs> All right, spin again. Okay. <laughs> Robert, are you with us? Seems like no one wants the eighth prize, right? No one listened to my announcement. <laughs> All right, guys, let's keep going. Are you here? Ask oh, man. All right, just because okay. everybody has more opportunities. <laughs> Eighth winner. Eighth winner. Oh. All right, we're going to keep spinning. A song here. Where did everyone go? You guys knew that you had to stay. Okay. All right, eighth winner. Let's try it again. Larissa, are you here? 
okay, we might just have to <laughs> find a way to give it to someone. Okay, let's do the last one. Let's do the last one for the eighth one and then we'll just. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. That's all it was. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I get to you. Okay, She's just good. coming too. Good. All right. Congrats, everyone. And remember, you'll get an email about your prizes. Okay. So now to the grand prize. So let's see who wins the grand prize. Please spin the yeah, wheel. All righty. Okay. Is Beth here? Beth. Oh no. Okay, let's keep going. Is Imani here? Okay, so the last draw, if nobody is here, then we won't give it out. Yes? Okay. All righty. Good luck, y'all. Is Nicholas here? Okay, the very last one, the very, very last <laughs> one. David, I'm here. This is strange. This is strange. I, I didn't plan this, please. I didn't plan this at all. I, I, I had no control. They told you 95%, whatever it is, right? Not, not me. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations. Um, yes, please go on, Jake. All right. So again, congrats to all the winners. and so happy we got through that. And I give a big hearty thanks to Amber and Divya for just an awesome game. Now I get the pleasure of passing it off to Dr. Yankee for a quick word. The Dean invited guests, faculty, students, and all attendees. Good evening once again. On behalf of the organizers of Meta Series, may I show great appreciation to all for making Meta Series 6 a reality. It's been a brilliant evening, and this is another proof that we have subdued limitations of our times. Dr. Rodney Lane, we are most thankful for your unfailing and exceptional support for Meta Series as well as ensuring a success in the path of public health. We extend profound appreciation to our wonderful guest speakers for the truly methodical, educative, and interesting sections given. Dr. Ramsey White and Dr. Shannon Brown, we are our academic servants and our students and staff, we will continue to draw on your advice and mentorship as we propel through our times in the School of Public Health and beyond. We thank faculty and all students for sustenance and continued participation in Meta Series. I hope you all enjoyed the icebreaker session. So this is a great moment to exhibit unusual familiarity with your environment. Also, if you won a prize, kindly remember to go for your chariot prizes, which serves not only as evidence that you participated in Meta Series, but also as evidence of unusual luck, right? Because everyone had an identical chance of winning. May I acknowledge that your evaluation of Meta Series 5 greatly contributed to the successful model for Meta Series 6. As Dr. Lane put it, it is important for us to connect and make an impact in public health. So please send us your evaluation, your critique, comments, recommendations, and commendations when you receive the link or request. We wish you all really successful times. 
Dr. Mensa, please take it from here. All righty. So very briefly, I want to say thank you to everyone who made it. Thank you, BSPH alums. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Angela Hurley, uh, program coordinator. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm very, very happy to see you and hope to see you again for Meta Series 7. Maybe this time won't be virtual, we'll be in person. Thank you very much and, and wait to hear from you from your prizes. Bye-bye.